Greetings, Lunarians and Brigandine fans. Welcome back to the Empire. I'm your host, Bagus Sonari, back with another guide video for you. This is going to cover advanced class changes. We're going to be looking at class changes from both leaders and monsters, so definitely stay tuned for both sections. We're going to be talking about what would be optimal for cross-classing certain knights to certain classes, considering both magic abilities and passive abilities. And the monsters are very simple, that won't take long, so this is mostly going to be focused on what type of builds that you might be interested in going for. Do you want to cross-class a mage with a fighter? Do you want to cross-class a cleric with a bar? There's a whole bunch of different options that we can look at. So let's get into it. Okay, we are going to hit up our capital here. We're going to go to quests and showcase what knights are going to be the demonstration knights for today's video. We're going to use Brendan, Farrick, Elena, Jack, and Leonora. Now keep in mind these aren't the starting levels of all these knights. I did do some questing to the training grounds a little bit to get prepared for the cross-classing demonstration. For example, Leonora starts at level 1. We had to get her to level 6 to get her proficiency up. I'll go over all of this here in a second. But just so you know, this is not the starting levels of all of these knights. But before we get into changing anybody's class, let's look at proficiency first. Go ahead and click on the castle that the knight is stationed at. We're going to go to troops and then hit up the class menu. Let's go ahead and use Farrick as an example, why not? So go ahead and click on Farrick. Under the class menu, we can see that he is currently a monk type. When you click on monk type, you can see what is the progression for this type of class, going to grappler at tier two and champion at tier three. This is basic class changing here. If you reach level 10, you can go to grappler. If you reach level 20, you can go to champion. Now notice how it says monk proficiency five underneath the grappler class here. That is what is required for you to change over to grappler. Now it also says you have to be level 10 or higher. However, you can master the monk's proficiency before you reach level 10. This is where cross-classing comes in, so pay very close attention. Since he has already reached a proficiency of five in the monk class, this means that we can go to any class that we want and work on a proficiency for a different type. So say for example, what's his stats? His stats on the bottom right are strength 62 as a monk, intelligence 68, and agility 57. So his intelligence stat is higher than the rest. So what we're gonna do is probably either pick a priest type or a mage type. Now you don't have to do this. This is my preference right here. You can pick whatever you want as long as you meet the requirements. But let's click on mage type really quick. You notice that we have to have at least 60 intelligence or higher in order to become a mage class. The same thing goes for any other type. If we go to thief type, notice how it's grayed out. Thief requires 60 agility points or higher. Notice Farrick does not have 60 agility points. He only has 57. So optimally, it may be in your best interest to go ahead and work on a different class type other than thief. You can pick barbarian, fighter, mage, or priest. I'm gonna pick mage type for this example. Before we commit, notice that we can see the changes in stats from the left-hand side to the right-hand side when you're going from monk to mage. Barracks intelligence will increase, the MP will increase, and also the combat power will increase. A bunch of other stats are decreasing in red, but do not let this discourage you from using cross-classing. On the top right-hand corner, you notice we have some tabs that say stats, skill, magic, and abilities. If we tab over to skill, we can compare the monk's skills and the mage skills. So let's tab over to the magic tab really quick. Notice that we have mastery icons next to flame, power, and acceleration on the mage class. This means that if you get five proficiency levels with a mage, you can carry these spells over to any other class. Remember that you get one proficiency rank per level. So since Farrick is level six, if I were to change him to mage right now, I have to get to level 11 as a mage in order to master those spells. Once I master those spells, I can, if I want to, come back to the monk type and then class up to grappler. This means that I can have a grappler class, which is tier two, with the mage spells. Let's go ahead and tab over to abilities. The same thing works for abilities. Notice that we have a mastery icon next to accuracy up B. The accuracy up B is coming from the monk class. Notice how the mage does not have abilities in their roster. They excel at magic abilities only, but other classes will have passive abilities like this that you can also carry over to any other class. 
Of course, accuracy up B isn't going to benefit a mage very much because they don't do a lot of damage in melee combat. However, this is just to showcase some more opportunities for some builds you might consider. Once you're done comparing, you can go ahead and commit and change the class. Going from monk to mage. Boom. So now that you are a mage, once again, you have to level up five times in order to receive five proficiency ranks to master the class. This again will allow you to carry over these spells to any other class. Let's take it one step further. Let's go down to Sorcerer, which is the tier two class of the mage type. Notice how many more spells we get. We get Weakness, Magic Down, Geno Flame, and Venom in the Sorcerer class. These also have mastery rank icons next to them. So if you are able to reach a proficiency level of five as a Sorcerer, you can carry those additional magic spells over to other classes as well. I can just imagine how ridiculous and awesome it's going to look when you take your grappler class out there with a whole bunch of magic spells. The versatility in this game is very real, so definitely take some time and experiment with what you want to build. Once the game officially releases and you've had time to get your hands dirty and experiment a little bit, I would love, love, love to hear what kind of builds you have put together in the comment section. Please, please indulge me. I would love to hear from you. And just for fun, let's see what the wizard gets at tier 3, level 20. Oh my, we get solid, exoblast, and curse. As you would expect, they are also able to be mastered and carried over to any other class. Okay, I think we've looked at Ferric for quite uh, enough time here. Let's go ahead and pick somebody else. So, let's pick a female class knight here. We're going to go with Elena. He is also level 6. So, if you click on Elena, notice how we have a proficiency level of 5 on the right hand side in the hunter type class. Basic class up for hunter, if you click on hunter type, you can class up to archer at level 10 and sniper at level 20. We'll look at these a little bit later, but right now we're interested in seeing what variety we can get from other class types. Let's back out and try to see what we can get from either lancer or dancer. Um, let's pick lancer really quick. So when we pick lancer, we can see the comparison on the right. Let's go to skills. Now, as I said before, as far as I can tell, skills are not able to be mastered from class to class. However, magic spells and abilities are able to be mastered. So let's take a look at magic. We have zero magic between Hunter and Lancer, so that's a bust. However, we have abilities. Notice that accuracy up B comes from the Hunter, which is already mastered because she has achieved level five proficiency as a Hunter. However, also notice that Dominate Sky B under the Hunter class is not able to be mastered. This is one example of an ability that cannot be carried over from class to class. This is because Dominate Sky is specific to ranged leaders and classes. However, if you notice what Lancer has, Lancer has a passive ability called Counter Damage Up B. If I were to change Elena over to a Lancer and receive level five proficiency as a Lancer, I can carry over that Counter Damage Up B passive ability to all the other classes I decide to go for. Once again, you receive one proficiency rank Per level. So if I change her to Lancer here, I will have to level Elena to level 11 in order to master the counter damage up passive ability. This of course allows me to carry that over to any other class I choose. Let's back out and look at Dancer as well. We'll do some variety here. Looking at Dancer in the comparison. So here's the stats right here. You notice in green what increases, red decreases and stuff, but we are mostly interested in what is able to be mastered as a Dancer. So in skills, there's no master here, of course. Going to magic, Dancer does have a magic spell. They have Venom, which can be mastered. They also have Evasion Up D. So once again, if I am able to achieve a rank five proficiency as a Dancer with Elena, I can carry over the magic spell Venom and the passive ability Evasion Up D to any other class. This will of course require her to achieve five levels as a Dancer, meaning that she must get to level 11. I will say that there is a fantastic item in this game that you will find that is rare, yes, but is extremely useful. This tier three item is known as an enlightenment scroll. If you look at the details, it says a scroll that boosts a knight's proficiency tier. So this file is a different file that I have on my Switch where Elena has not leveled up to level six yet. She's currently level five but she is stuck at proficiency level four. If you can obtain proficiency five at level five, you can make the most of your cross-classing. Keep in mind, you do not want to depend on these items. They are very rare. 
However, if you do obtain one, they are best used in this fashion. The max level in this game for any given unit is 30. So the basic concept behind the Enlightenment Scroll to make the best use of your cross-classing is to get to proficiency level 5 before you reach an actual level of 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25. It evens out the cross-classing very nicely so you can have the most versatility. So we're going to go ahead and use the Enlightenment Scroll on Elena so she can now have proficiency level 5 at level 5. Perfect. So now that we've obtained that, let's go ahead and change her class now from level 5 Hunter to, let's say, level 5 Dancer. Why not? This means that when we get to level 10 Dancer, she will be able to actually class up to Rogue at level 10 instead of level 11. I would advise any new player to make sure that you hold on to your Enlightenment Scrolls for these particular situations instead of spamming them on one leader. The whole concept may seem confusing at first, so please, if you do have any questions about this particular segment, please ask me below in the comments. I leave a pinned comment on the very top of the section saying, any questions, ask me here. Please leave your questions there. Okay, the next section that we're going to discuss is builds. I have another save file that I'm going to pop over to where I have quested a bunch of knights only on training to gain experience. That way we can experiment with cross-classing even further. This section will also include monster evolutions or class-ups. Okay, here's the other file. Let's go ahead and go to Harmonia and use Jack as an example here. As you can tell, we have a ton of class-ups just in this screen. There's a much more to come, so please stay tuned for some monsters later. But let's go ahead and use Jack right here as an example. This dude right here starts the game at a level eight fighter. Now notice that his class is still fighter. I have not classed him up yet to the next tier two class. If I go to his class screen, I choose fighter type. We have two different options that we can choose from between knight and also swordsman. You can see the trees that you can take if you choose to go for knight. If you choose knight, you can choose either paladin or dark knight when you get to level 20. If you choose swordsman, they will class up to sword master at level 20. So before we commit to a class, let's go ahead and take a look at the comparison on the right. Remember how we can tab over to stats, skill, magic, and abilities to see what we can carry over from our previously mastered class. So since we have 5 proficiency as a fighter, we can of course class up to knight or swordsman, but we also carry over any magic or abilities assigned to the fighter. So if we tab over to skill, there's nothing to master here. Magic has no mastery for fighter either, however, their ability is HP Recovery B. Once you master this passive ability as a fighter with proficiency level 5, and then carry this over to the next class. Of course, Knight will have HP Recovery B along with gaining Shield Block A. Notice how Shield Block A is not able to be mastered. These are specific to Knights because they do carry a shield. It makes a little difference anyways because once you commit to either Knight or Swordsman, you cannot cross-class back to the other one. Say, for example, if you choose Swordsman, you will not be able to go to Knight after choosing Swordsman. The opposite is also true. If you choose Knight, you cannot go to Swordsman after mastering the Knight class. So definitely plan your route wisely before you choose either one. So say, for example, we chose Knight. If you go to the Magic Abilities, we notice that the Heal spell can be mastered. This can also be carried over to any other class besides the Swordsman. Say, for example, you want to master the Knight class, get the Heal spell, and carry it over to a mage, for example. The mage with its offensive spells can then have some more versatility by owning the heal spell from a knight. We will actually demonstrate that here in just a moment. Another thing that might influence your decision is either choosing between paladin or dark knight. If any of these two classes do appeal to you more than the swordmaster, then you might want to choose knight right away instead of swordsman. So looking at the paladin, we notice that the paladin gets an additional spell called divine ray a very powerful 2 hex range single target holy spell that does a ton of damage. If you watched any of my previous demo videos that I streamed on Twitch, I used this I think a couple of times with Grottos. Very very powerful skill to have and you can also carry this over to another class as well. So imagine taking the heal spell and divine ray over to a mage class to increase the divine ray damage even further because mages will naturally have more intelligence. Looking at the passive abilities for Paladin, it does not unfortunately gain any more passive abilities that can be mastered, 
However, the shield block does increase to rank S. I believe that it's a 25% chance of blocking, yes. It's extremely powerful on rank S, but yes, it cannot be carried over to other classes that do not use a shield. Looking at Dark Knight, we have the black magic spell equivalent to Divine Ray, which is Curse. Basically the same thing just as a dark element. It does a ton of damage, two hexes away to a single target. This of course can also be carried over to a mage class or whatever class you decide once you master the Dark Knight class. The abilities are the exact same as the Paladin except it gets one less rank in the shield block. This is probably because the Dark Knight is effectively going to do more damage than the Paladin in melee combat. It's a very minuscule change however, it's only 5% difference on shield block, but that is probably the case with the Dark Knight as opposed to the Paladin. Dark Knight does more damage while sacrificing shield block percentage, while Paladin gets the best shield block while sacrificing a little bit more damage in melee combat. Moving on to the Swordsman, let's take a look at the abilities for this class. So we notice the Swordsman does not gain any magic spells. However, we do gain a passive ability that can be mastered. It is Critical Rate Up C. If you are to master the Swordsman class, you can of course carry this passive ability over to another class as well. Say for example, the Monks or Grappler classes, they benefit heavily from high critical rate. This passive ability can also heavily benefit a Barbarian class, anything that really does a ton of physical damage. So a cool cross-classing idea would be master the Swordsman class, get the critical rate up passive, and then switch over to Barbarian to do more damage with high crit chance. Again, there's a ton of stuff that you can do. Please, please look at every single class ability and magic ability to decide what you want to do for your builds for each leader. Going up to Sword Master at tier 3 level 20, we get the sidestep ability with this particular class, which as we can tell cannot be mastered and carried over. However, it has a 50% chance of dodging bow attacks. This is an effect carried over from the original game of Grand Edition back in 2000. The samurai classes in Grand Edition way back when were able to cut down any arrows that were shot at them from either a leader that was an archer or a centaur. If an arrow was coming at them, they had a chance to cut it down, therefore taking zero damage. Pretty cool mechanic. Before we move on to cross-classing to the mage class to see how abilities are carried over, Let's go ahead and take a look at the status screen between Paladin, Dark Knight, and Swordmaster. As I suspected before, if you go between the Paladin and Dark Knight, look on the right hand side, you can see the stats changing between HP, MP, Attack, Strength, Intelligence, etc. We already see a little tiny change between the attack values. Paladin is sitting at 129 for attack value, and Dark Knight has an increased value of 132. Notice how Paladin has more HP, Dark Knight has less, Paladin has more defense, Dark Knight has less, you get the idea. You'll also notice the elemental orbs on the sword icon and the shield icon. This is for attack element and defense element. So Dark Knight will have a heavy influence on dark damage and also resist dark damage. Paladin, of course, will have a heavy influence attacking with holy damage and defending against holy damage. We can go into detail at a later time on how the orbs actually work for influencing damage, but for right now, let's go ahead and stick to the script here. And going down to Swordmaster, let's go back and forth between the Dark Knight and the Swordmaster and see some of the differences here. So Dark Knight and Swordmaster seem to have the same attack value, which is 132. The agility, however, goes way up for the Swordmaster. Look at that. It's an agility of 77. Dark Knight has an agility of 69. Definitely a huge increase for the Swordmaster if you plan on being more evasive. You can get a good idea of where you want to go by looking at a knight's starting stats. If you notice, Jack's starting stats is a fighter on the left. We have an attack value of 126, strength is 84, intelligence 65, agility 69. Pretty versatile, however strength does come out on top for him, so you might be more beneficial either going to Paladin or Dark Knight instead of Swordmaster. However, as you can tell, the agility stat does get a nice boost if you go to Swordmaster, so please take your pick. However, always consider the starting stats of a knight to make sure you want to capitalize or spread out the stats evenly. I usually like to spread out the stats evenly, so I think on my first playthrough, at least as Norzalio, I'll probably end up having Jack go down the Swordsman route to obtain Swordmaster at level 20. I guarantee there's going to be a ton of discussion in the Discord server and also in the comments on these videos on what people have built throughout their playthroughs. By all means, please leave me a comment anywhere you like on any video that I release. I would love to know what builds you have come up with. Anyways, let's go ahead and finally commit. I'm actually going to commit to the Knight class right here. 
Let's go ahead and change from Fighter to Knight. And we'll get the heal spell, of course, from this. Now, keep in mind, we do not have the Knight class mastered yet. As you can tell, Jack's proficiency is currently at zero for the Knight class. He's going to have to get his five proficiency ranks from either leveling or using the rare item that I mentioned earlier. This will enable him to master the Knight class and carry over the heal spell to any other class. So let's pretend like he has five proficiency levels, okay? So if we go down to the Mage class type and we hit this, you'll see the heal spell on the right with flame, power, and acceleration. It'll be in blue lettering and there will be a lit up mastery icon next to the heal spell. Notice how in our abilities we are carrying over the HP Recover B from the Fighter class to the Mage as well. However, of course, as I said before, we cannot carry over the Shield Block A passive because it is unable to be mastered by the Knight. So as a quick recap here, whatever class you decide to go to, make sure that you have the required statistic. And if you wish to carry over any magic spells or abilities that can be mastered, be sure that you gain enough proficiency levels in that specific class before you change over to another class. Last thing to note, make sure that you use your enlightenment scrolls sparingly. The optimal time to use those scrolls is if your leader is at level 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25, and they are lacking one additional proficiency tier for mastery. This will guarantee that you have the most freedom with your cross-classing. And the final showcase here, let's go ahead and class up some monsters. This is not going to take very long, it's very basic. When you level your monsters to either level 10 or level 20, you can class them up to the next tier. So looking at the Gygas right here, this is a tier 1 monster. He is currently at level 11, which is past level 10, meaning we can go to tier 2. Let's click on the Gygas. You'll see the up icon that tells you that you can class the monster up. And here is tier 2 Cyclops for the Gygas. Notice the stat growths on the right hand side. The portrait also changes, the model will change as well. You'll see a whole bunch of stuff. The only stat that is in red is the magic cost. It does cost more to hold an evolved monster on a troop. So make sure that you have enough in your magic pool to hold the evolved monster. You can also tab over to see if you get any additional skills. We do in this case when we class up to Cyclops. The Power Fist becomes Hyper Fist, which is more damage, and they also get an additional skill called Heavy Impact. The description of Heavy Impact is major damage to a single adjacent enemy unit and also has a 33% chance of inflicting Faint and decreases the target's attack and defense. Very, very powerful skill. When you inflict Faint on a unit, they cannot counterattack you. Heavy Impact is actually a specific skill where they can't counterattack you anyways, even if you do not inflict Faint. A Cyclops' basic attack or a Gygas' basic attack also has a chance of inflicting Faint. The basic attack, of course, can be countered if Faint is not inflicted, but regardless, using Heavy Impact, even if you do not inflict Faint, it cannot be countered. Having over to Magic, they do not get any Magic abilities here at Tier 2. The Cyclops gains a passive Faint immunity, which is huge, meaning they will always have a chance to counterattack melee attacks. Of course, they will not be able to counter magic or any ranged attacks. However, being immune to faint is huge. Very, very good passive ability. Let's go ahead and look at the class up and see what it looks like. So, look at the difference right here. This is the 3D model on the battlefield. Cost is going up from 50 to 65. So, again, make sure that your leader has enough magic pool in order to hold the monster. Let's commit. And we got a Cyclops. Very pretty. Awesome. All right, let's do another one. Why not? This lizard right here actually has two tiers. There's a tier two and a tier three. So we're at level 10. We can go to high lizardmen right here. And notice that we have a tier three as well. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's look at the stat differences on the right. We notice that there is a coloration difference in the portrait. And of course, the magic cost goes up from 40 to 55. Once again, make sure that you have enough in your magic pool to hold the classed up monster. You can tell also that we get a significant increase in combat power as well. This one in particular is going up from 580 CP to 757 CP. Since I have a whole bunch of class ups to do in this file, what I'm going to see is what my overall combat power is before classing a whole bunch of stuff up and see what it comes out to be afterwards. That's going to be fun. Anyways, looking at the skills, we have just a different name skill here. 
it's basically going from minor damage here, as you can see, to moderate damage. So, an increased damaging normal attack. We don't get any magic abilities for the class up. And we also don't get any changes for the passive abilities. The Lizardmen really kind of thrive with good equipment. So, make sure that you do give them decent equipment so they can thrive a little bit better. Because, as you can tell, they do not get a ton of versatility. So, I'll commit to the High Lizardmen here later, but let's go ahead and look at the Lizard Lord. As you can tell, we have a very specific requirement to get to Lizard Lord. Notice how it says Champion Medal. This is a quest item. Whatever quest you can find that has that cup symbol, you have a chance of obtaining these specific items to class up to Tier 3. The Tier 2 Dragons, for example, require an Eternal Hellfire that also has that same icon next to it. So there's a bunch of items that you can grab from quests in order to get to Tier 3. So definitely look out for them and use them wisely. So looking at the tabs for the Lizard Lord here, we really don't get any big changes to damage. The Glory Swing is still a moderate damage dealing attack. However, we don't get any magic of course, but the abilities is where the Lizard Lords really shine. The Shield Block goes up to S, which is of course the 25% block chance I showcased this earlier. But the big thing for the Lizard Lords is that they get a double action. It says it allows a unit to act again after their initial action. This means you can move and attack and then move and attack again. Very, very powerful stuff, especially if you have really good gear for the lizards. So as I said before, try to see if you can capitalize on good gear for lizardmen. They will be much more powerful than you anticipate. Anyways, we'll look at two more here. We'll look at the uh, mermaid here and we'll also look at something else in another castle. So let's look at the mermaid. We can see that the mermaid can class up to a siren. Notice the combat power difference. The stats in green are increasing. Of course, the magic cost is increasing. As you can tell with the magic cost here, this one has a much bigger increase than the previous monsters that I showcased. So the Gygus going to a Cyclops only increased the magic cost by 15, and so did the Lizardman to the High Lizardman. Classing up from Mermaid to Siren increases the magic cost by 30. This is with good reason though, because she does get additional skills and magic abilities. Notice the comparison here. We have Splash Thrust and Charm Song. Aqua Thrust and Lure Song are pretty much the same exact thing. So if we look at the descriptions, Normal Attack here dealing moderate damage. Aqua Thrust is the exact same thing, just named different for flavor. Looking at Charm Song, it inflicts charm on a single enemy unit in water within a 3 hex radius. Lure Song simply expands that radius to 4 instead of 3, but the main bit is she gets Maelstrom as a new skill. The description says it deals massive damage to all units in water within a 2 hex radius. It will never miss and has a 25% chance of inflicting faint. This is an extremely powerful skill, but it is very, very situational. Number one, you have to use it while you are on water. And number two, you can hit your allies with this attack. A cool tactic that you can use to pop this off effectively is to give the Siren some protective buffs send her into a whole bunch of enemies around water and then use the ability now of course that is very risky do not get her out of range of healing spells for example but if you play your cards right you can turn the tide of any battle little pun there sorry <laughs> tabbing over to magic we notice that we gain the frost spell from her initial spells so as a mermaid she does not really have any offensive capabilities but as a siren she of course has the maelstrom that she gets and she gains an attack spell called frost there are no passive abilities that can be inherited however getting these new skills and magic spells kind of justifies the magic cost increase from 25 to 55. just be sure to keep an eye on your leader's magic pool at all times to make sure you can hold all these monsters and their increased costs and we'll commit to this one why not let's go ahead and see it going from mermaid to siren bam Different coloration, a little bit of a bigger model. And uh, yeah, there's a siren, cool. Okay, let's do one more. We need to go to a different castle for this one. What do we got up in Lancer here? Oh, I see which one I'm gonna do. Okay, so notice we have a ton of class ups here. I'm gonna commit to all of these here later on and show you what the combat power increase will be. But I want to show you the dragon class ups. Here's a level 10 tier one dragon ready to class up to tier two. Clicking on it, we notice that we have a ton of different variations of tier 2 dragons we can pick from. There is a dragon for each element in this game, which is amazing. In the original game, you did not get all of the elements available to you for tier 2 dragons. We only ever got a fire dragon and a holy dragon. Here we have fire dragon, frost dragon, 
Thunder Dragon, Holy Dragon, and Dark Dragon. Looking at the Flame Dragon here, notice that we have an Ancient Dragon right beneath it. As I said earlier with the High Lizard Men, you have to get certain items in order to class up to Tier 3. This example being, of course, you have to give a Flame Dragon an Eternal Hellfire in order to class it up to an Ancient Dragon. This is true for any Tier 2 Dragon that you pick. Frost Dragon also requires the Eternal Hellfire. So does Thunder Dragon, Holy Dragon, etc. All of the Tier 2s require that item to get to Ancient. So looking back at Tier 2, let's look at the Flame Dragon really quick in comparison. Notice the magic cost. This goes up by 25. We had a 15 increase earlier from the Gygas to Cyclops. We also had a 30 increase from the Mermaid to Siren. Here, we have a 25 increase in magic cost from Dragon Tier 1 to Flame Dragon. This increase in cost is also true for Frost Dragon and all the other elemental dragons, but yes, it is 25 for a Tier 2 class up in magic cost. Tabbing over to the skills here, dragons have a specific attack called Acid Breath. This one deals minor damage to all units within a 3 hex straight line. It is also 100% accurate and it will never miss. All the other tier 2 dragons do get the same exact type of attack, which is Fire Breath here for the Flame Dragon. But notice that it increases the breath range from 3 hexes in a straight line to a 4 hex straight line. This of course will be doing red elemental damage with this attack. As far as magic and abilities, dragons do not get any of that. Their main focus is their breath attacks and elemental advantages. Going back to stats here, we notice that the tier 1 dragon starts with one red orb in both attack and defense. If you class it up to a flame dragon, it gains one red orb in attack and defense. Red orbs are ideal in going against units that have green orbs as a resistance. We haven't talked too much about orbs, but a basic concept is if you have red attacking orbs going against green shield orbs, you will do increased damage because green is weak to red. Going further with that, blue is weak to green and red is weak to blue. Black and white will always oppose each other. So definitely try to get as much versatility in elemental orbs as you can with all of your units. You want a good mixture of that because you never know what you're going to be up against. And finally, looking at the ancient dragon, we notice that we get yet again another elemental orb in both attack and defense. If this bad boy is fighting a whole bunch of green units, it is going to tear through them, as well as have heavy resistance against other red attacks. Having over to skills here, we notice that we get something extra on the right. So if you look at the Ancient Dragon's skills, the Flame Lord's Fury is the simple normal attack. It will deal major damage to a single adjacent enemy unit. Going to Ultimate Flare, this right here is a new ability for the Dragon class. It is a pre-move ability, meaning that you cannot move and use this ability in the same turn. If you are able to stay put and use this on an adjacent unit, you will deal a ton of damage. Notice how Flame Lord's Fury says major damage, Ultimate Flare does massive damage. The term massive is the highest term for damage that you can get in this game. So if you are able to pull this off on a green unit that is weak to red, they are going to probably die in one shot from full health, if not very close to it. Beyond that, the Breath Attack gets yet another upgrade. So the Tier 2 Dragons get a 4 Hex Straight Line Breath Attack. The Ancient Dragon gets a 5 Hex Straight Line Breath Attack. This is very powerful stuff and is crucial for positioning your entire army around this type of attack. We're going to use this skill in particular when I come out with Advanced Combat Mechanics, so definitely remember this attack in particular so we can take advantage of that on the battlefield. Unfortunately, the Ancient Dragon gets no magic abilities or passive abilities. However, I don't think they need it too much. <laughs> Normal attacks are powerful enough along with their breath attack. Yes, their breath attack does cost MP. However, they excel greatly in just their normal skill abilities. So we'll use one more example before we quit here. The Frost Dragon is another variant you can use for a Tier 2 Dragon. If you're wanting to create some more variety in your army and you are kind of lagging on blue elements, this could be a nice option for your army. But looking at the Frost Dragon, tabbing over to skills, we of course have the same idea with increased damage on the normal attack and the breath attack. Breath attack still of course getting an increased straight line hex range from 3 to 4, but of course you're doing ice damage instead of fire damage in this case. No magic or passive abilities on this as well, they're all pretty much the same. Whatever element you decide to go to, that's the element that you're going to be doing with your basic attacks and your breath attacks. No matter what tier 2 dragon you pick, 
they all will end up going to the Ancient Dragon. Notice that the Ancient Dragon still has the triple red on their attack and defense, no matter which tier 2 dragon that you pick. This was actually kind of off-putting to me at first to not see any variety in the Ancient Dragon. However, you have to remember that you can gain additional attack orbs and resistance orbs with gear. The maximum amount of orbs that you can have on either attack or defense, I believe, in this game is 13. If I am wrong, of course, I will correct myself later, but this means that you can vary your elemental damage any way you see fit as long as you have the proper gear. So by all means, do not be afraid to class up to Ancient Dragon if you have the capability. Regardless of it being red every single time, you have a very powerful unit at your disposal. These dragons have the potential to be one of the most versatile monsters in the game if you can get additional orbs on attack and defense. As we know, red orbs are weak to blue orbs. If you are able to get three blue orbs on your resistance, the damage will then become normalized when you get hit with a blue attack instead of being weak to that blue attack. Having blue orbs on your attack as an ancient dragon is also very important because if a red elemental attack goes against a red resistance, that red resistance will of course reduce the red attack damage. However, you can mitigate this resistance by also having blue orbs on your attack because red is weak to blue. So for example, if three red, three blue attacks a three red resistance, the resistance and the weakness to blue will cancel each other out and the damage will be normalized. I know it can be a confusing mechanic if you are not seeing it being played out. So please, if you do have questions of any sort, Leave them in the comment section below. I will be happy to answer any questions for you. So just for fun, I've never seen a Dark Dragon in Brigandine in my life. So we are going to pick Dark Dragon. Let's go. I'm excited for this. Tier 1 Dragon 2, Dark Dragon. Doing dark damage on both of the normal attack and the breath attack. This is going to be amazing. I can't wait to get into it, man, for real. So before we look at the last feature of today's guide with the combat power changes, I want to point out something very important. So notice if I try to exit the menu, a troop has exceeded its magic pool. This comes from the Dark Dragon class that I just classed up. We notice that Grados' troop has minus seven magic pool, so we have exceeded his maximum pool. This means that we need to move something into another troop's pool in order to get rid of that minus seven. So let's simply go ahead and take the Golem, for example. It's only 45 cost. GU has 63 left, so we have plenty of room. Let's go ahead and change there. And just like that, it's done. <laughs> and now we can exit. Okay, let's look at the biggest feature of today's guide, which is the combat power change after classing everything up within our country. Let's go. So to check our total combat power within our country, all the knights, all the monsters included, let's go ahead and pull up the menu and go down to Nation Statistics. Rosalio is currently sitting at a total combat power of 42,242. That already seems stupid high, but let's see how far we can get by classing up all the monsters that I was able to do before the demo ended. So let me go ahead and take care of all the class ups. I will be right back. All right, everyone, everything is classed up, leaders and monsters and everything like that included. I have not seen the total combat power changes yet, Let's see what we got after classing everything up. Menu, nation statistics, we had like, what, 42,000 or something like that on the previous, uh, before we classed everything up. So, statistics we have 47,406. Pretty significant increase. So, it's what, a 3,000 combat power increase? It may seem minuscule, but that is huge, actually. So, please do not knock it. That is a huge increase. About 3,000. Pretty cool, man. I like that. However, notice that we have run into a little bit of a problem as well. Our expected mana income is now in decline, so we have to be careful on what we class up and what we do not. This is why I mentioned to always keep an eye on this screen in particular when managing your mana. If you have missed my mana guide that I have put out recently, it is in the top right hand corner with all the other guides you can find. Please review the mana guide in particular to make sure that you can manage it properly and not get into this situation right here where your mana is in decline. Now, assuming you can be successful at a couple of invasions, you can get the mana from those new castles that you do invade and mitigate this decline in mana. But don't assume that you're always going to win your invasion because I don't know exactly what the AI is going to do 
in the harder difficulties. It may be ridiculously hard and I may have just screwed myself right here by classing up a whole bunch of monsters. So just please take care. Always refer back to the screens to make sure that you do not have a decline in your currency. Anyways, everyone, that's going to wrap it up for me. I am your host, Vagal Sonari. It was such a pleasure bringing you this guide today. People have been requesting this guide for quite some time, and I'm sorry it took so long to get it out. But there is a ton of information to cover, to be fair. So I am working on a new guide, which is going to be an in-depth look at questing. It's going to give you some information on who to quest where and what items you can get in certain locations. I'll be creating an in-depth questing guide for each individual country. So as soon as the game officially releases and I have access to all the other countries, each one of the countries will be getting an in-depth questing guide. So of course, since I only have access to Norzalio on the demo, that will be coming first. And of course, the rest of them will be coming after release. Other guides I have coming in the near future involve strategies with team composition and also an in-depth look at gear, etc. If you wish to request a certain guide from myself, please go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. I tally up all requests for specific guide categories and I will be sure to have that out for you as soon as possible. There is also a guide request section in my Discord server, that way I can keep better track of it. If you are not in the Discord server for Brigandine right now that I am hosting, you can find that in the description along with the wiki page and the engine website, etc. Brigandine fans, I really hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more content like this. Definitely look out for more guides in the future from myself and Let's Play series of each country. If you do not know who I'm going to release first as my first Let's Play series, it is going to be the Holy Gustave Empire. After I am finished with the first playthrough, I will be leaving a voting tally for you guys to choose which faction that I play next after that faction is complete. That way you can have some participation in what is to come next on this channel. Brigandine fans, thank you so much. You mean the world to me. I am your host, Vago Sonari. I will see you in the next guide video, Let's Play series, or the Brigandine Discord server. See you on the battlefield, Rune Knights. Peace. Bye.